Hi, everyone. Um, morning, and thanks very much for hosting us again. Um, well done for that. We're going to introduce, as Helen was saying, a, a project that continues from the FRC work, um, and, and having them as a partner has been an, an immeasurably beneficial. So just a big thanks to you guys as well. Um, the project is called Biosmart. It's, I'm going to talk a, do a few acronyms, and just for everybody that's on the call, I'll go through this, because I know that can be quite horrifying. The Biosmart is Biodiversity Systems Management and Analytics for the Restoration of Transboundary Rivers. We'll show you a few um, maps, but they're essentially the rivers that flow easterly towards Mozambique, um, through South Africa to Mozambique and Swaziland. Thanks, Peter. Which one is happening here? Press this one and then you can go as fast as you want this one, yeah? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, there's a bit of an outline, just to welcome. I'll introduce you to us as the team and then to Biosmart. And then Hugo will take us through the Biosmart progress um, and then we can open up to discussions, but we'll dot it with some question time and comments along the way. Um, the, the team as it stands currently at the moment, there's myself, as Helen said, I'm the head of award. We're a, um, a non-profit, but slightly unusual, I suppose, because we do research and implementation. Hugo is my colleague who's with me, you'll hear from him today. Julia, our finance manager, Carl, who's been doing the data cleaning and collection, and Karen, who does the, the monitoring and evaluation for us. Um, that's the team at the FRC that we're working closely with. Uh, I think you've been introduced to most of those people. And then Tim, this is how you, <laughs> you refer to yourself on your website, the, the guys from Cartosa, so thank you. That wasn't our terminology, that was there, <laughs> <laughs> the computer geeks. Um, right, a little bit of background. There's a, a map there on the right just showing the rivers that we work in. Just grab the pointer here. This is the, um, the olefant system that goes into the, the Limpopo. Then a little bit below that, we've got, gosh, I'm sorry, I've just got the heads in the way. Thanks, you guys. We've got, and then the, the um, Uncomati and Nostitu system down here. Um, and for many of you from, not from South Africa, <clears throat> there's a little locality map down here. And as I was saying, these are the rivers right up in the north of South Africa that flow in an easterly direction um, and then into Mozambique and Swaziland. So whatever happens in South Africa, the upstream user and um, producer of water has much broader impact than just South Africa alone. It's, it's for those um, downstream countries who rely on good management from South Africa. And that's very much a part of an ongoing process. Um, some of the, the figures that you see up there around the fish species that we've got in each of those river systems, thanks to the, the EFSA system, we're now able to <laughs> finally give a tally. I know the colleagues from Rwanda and, and Uganda were also noting that only recently have they really been able to give kind of overall species numbers um, through the JRS supported project that they've been doing. And it's the same for us. I mean, it's extraordinary, but it's, you know, data's been collected in portions of the river, but when you're trying to tie it together for an overall picture, it's been really difficult. And I think as everybody said, it's why this, um, these projects are so beneficial. Like everybody else, I think uh, has noted we, all of these main transboundary rivers are under threat, mainly from anthropogenic activity. I think what distinguishes South Africa and these rivers is the, particularly the impact of mining, um, coal mining and platinum mining. And that's had a huge impact both on water availability, but particularly on, on water quality. And that's become a major driver of change. We've got climate change and very recently um, data that we've been modeling both on the impacts of climate change on uh, both water availability and on uh, dam capacity. And the figures are really alarming. Um, in the near term, we're looking at up to a 50% reduction in stream flow of these right up against Mozambique water. And I think, it, you know, when you think in QMEX and, you know, if you have kind of in the low flows, you've got maybe two QMEX crossing the border in a lot of these rivers, and we're looking at a 50% reduction. Um, one, you know, starts to see what that means for aquatic health, um, with biodiversity being a measure, one of the important measures. 
uh, invasive species. Hugo's going to show you some maths around that. Um, and that is one of the drivers in, in the system. The other important thing is we've got a, um, a benchmark in South Africa that's called the reserve. And it's an amount of water that is reserved to meet basic human needs and water to keep the, the rivers healthy, if I can put it in very simplistic terms. It's what more globally is called environmental water requir requirements or environmental flow. Um, and those have been set for the rivers. So we at least have a benchmark against which we measure we're able to measure and then look at whether or not um, the, the flows are and water quality are compliant with that. And work we did about a decade ago showed that all the rivers are non-compliant, sometimes up to 60% of the time. Now, the interesting thing about the reserve or these environmental flows is the hypothesis is that if you maintain that flow, you're also maintaining biodiversity. And so a lot of the data that's being collected recently is trying to give effect to whether or not that is in fact the right, that's correct. And these flows are dynamic. Um, so it's just important to note that. Okay, so why do we need all this information? Um, I think like everybody said, we have an enormous problem with status monitoring. I've mentioned the compliance monitoring. Are we complying with these benchmarks that have been set for the country and for different rivers? And then also we need the information in South Africa. Um, I'm less sure about how this happens other than in Mozambique and Swaziland and Botswana. You have to put biodiversity data or considerations into your water use licenses, which is that WULA, the water use license authorization. And in, um, it should form part of the reconciliation strategies where we re reconcile water availability with, with water use in the basin or catchment. And all of those management activities in blue, status monitoring, compliance monitoring, and then strategic planning and action, all of them are constrained by data access and the ability to share data and analyze data. Um, and that's why this project has been so important for us. It's, it's not to say that if we sort out the bioinformatics, we've sorted out monitoring, but certainly it's a huge constraint in the system. Um, so it's really important for us. Okay, just going on a little bit more, there's the, the rivers again. You can see more clearly here the, the neighboring countries, Zimbabwe in the north, Mozambique and Swaziland. Um, all of the stakeholders we work with, and we've worked in, in this region for a long time, um, you know, up to 20 years. Um, but we've got problems with discontinuous data. I think most of the other talks have mentioned that intermittent data, but that data certainly indicates that despite the incredibly progressive uh, uh, legislation in South Africa, um, river health is deteriorating most of the rivers. And that begs the question why, if we've got this really good legislative framework, what's happening? And I know from work that um, I've been doing and then did later with Hugo is that um, there are all sorts of governance challenges, which I won't go into, but one of the issues is that um, we've got a problem around maintenance, curation, and data conformity. And I've mentioned that as well. Um, and, and there's this need to set up these baselines, particularly as there's more and more conflict about access to water and water use licensing in the country. There's very little data that can support the idea that river health is declining in any evidence-based manner, because it's just so hard to access the data. So we put in, in, a, in red there, this baseline for biodiversity is, is a huge con constraint. And then on top of that, trying to track temporal and spatial changes. And I know Helen and Jim mentioned that also for their work. Um, and then looking at ways in which to assess the impacts of, of these drivers on biodiversity. So there's this urgent need to have a shared base database for freshwater biodiversity data. And importantly, that allows us in trying to cope with these uncertain futures to ask questions around what if. So what if we start seeing the impacts of climate change in the area? What if um, there's unlawful water use? What does it mean? And um, there are those two distinguishing features in our talk from maybe what you've heard in the other talks. Um, and so let me just foreground that quickly. 
One of the things I'm going to I'm going to emphasize is the need to link what we're doing under the JRS project with governance and and management of our freshwater system. So yes, we get all this data, but then how do we put that into action? So I'm going to emphasize that quite a lot. And coming out of that, we're going to show you a decision support system called INWIS. <laughs> it's another acronym. But um, we and and just show you how we we link the data sets from freshwater biodiversity and then other data sets around helping water resource managers make decisions and inform um, future planning, strategic planning. Okay. That's when our project runs. It started in September 2019 and until March 2023. Um, the access to data challenge, we're building on the work that, um, that the FRC started for the Cape region and you know, around the Western Cape um, and elsewhere. And that's being addressed, you've all heard in it by now about not this, if this. <laughs> Um, and then the proposal was that we would expand IFPIS to the northern part of the country, but in fact now it's happening you know, across the country. Um, at the time we started, there was still no open source platform to consider biodiversity together with these drivers of change, and we'll talk a bit about that. And because of that, we've developed this um, integrated water resource decision support system known as INWIS. And we've tested it in one of those rivers, the Olifant, and it's in fact has been used um, to support a bunch of things. One of them is to keep the river flowing uh, during the worst drought on record, which has just ended. It's been a five year drought and it's just ended with rains this rainy season. Um, and in that we've integrated biodiversity and drivers of change. Well, certainly the proposal is to start integrating the biodiversity data, which Hugh will show you. Um, and we, the whole time, our purpose is to support water resource managers and stakeholders um, to operate and manage the system, but to keep an eye on biodiversity, because biodiversity currently gets forgotten in the decision making process because it's so blooming hard to access data. And so a lot of these catchment officers, when they're trying to authorize water use through the, the licenses, they say to us, they can't actually access the biodiversity data. And so they actually just leave it alone and hope nobody notices. them. So in yellow, we've really highlighted, I, I keep emphasizing this, the role that the um, EFIS data is going to play in monitoring, analysis, and decision-making. And again, just to highlight, that's the, the, the kind of a, probably a, a small difference we bring to the table. Um, Sorry, I'm going to make a print there. All right. Um, just to share with you our, our <clears throat> aims and objectives. You can see the main aim up there is enhanced bioinformatic capacity. Um, and, you know, I've spoken through a bit of that, and we're doing that through four main activities and objectives. Um, one of them is to expand and promote the use of EFIS. Um, and that's been in itself quite a um, interesting and useful journey already. The second one is to enhance the systemic and analytical capacity of IFSA. So it's been what I've been talking about. It's this ability to take the biodiversity data, integrate it with, with drivers of change in the system, and use that or to help decision makers and stakeholders, for example, managers in the Kruger Park or managers in the cash management agency to make decisions and to take action. And in doing that, we're developing the capacity or, or training, which is a bit more kind of didactic term, but in the, in the use of EFIS and the inward system. And um, that has already started. And then the fourth objective is to document and share the lessons learned. And I think by now, most of you will have had the interview with the new JRS director, um, Malcolm. And I think he's very keen on the documenting and sharing. All right, sorry, John, I could just hear somebody coming in there. This is an incredibly busy slide, so first of all, apologies. Um, but it's really to demonstrate, don't worry, you, Hugo will take you through the detail of this. I think there's... Are we being hacked again? No, <laughs> if someone's <laughs> mic seems to be on. Helen, I don't know if you can see whose mic's on. 
Um, okay. So what we've got on the on the left is the IFPA system, which is collecting biodiversity data, and on the right um, is the inward system, which we'll take you through. But the but what was missing from the inward system was the biodiversity data. And so this has provided that opportunity to integrate that into the inward system, which is the system on the right, which is the decision support system. Okay. Partners, this won't mean very much to those of you that are outside of South Africa, but obviously the FRC, you know, South African National Parks, they're the, the organization that manages the Kruger, which is the last water receiver and user um, before the border with, with Mozambique and Swaziland. The, this is another acronym you'll keep hearing, a CMA or the IUCMA. I know, Hugo, you'll use it quite a lot. So just to take a moment to say to people, South Africa, we have these catching management agencies, although we don't. We have two um, that are up and, and running. And one of them that is doing particularly well is the Incomatia Sutu Catching Management Agency. And we're working hand in hand with them. They're very keen on, on this entire system, which is fabulous. So the, the CMAs manage water. They're the Water Resources Management Agency. They're a parastatal and they're supported through our Ministry of Water Affairs. Um, but they do, you know, they do have, or they're increasingly getting autonomy and they're currently involved in monitoring and in some of the compliance enforcement. Um, and part of their job is to incorporate biodiversity. So they're an important partner. Then we've got our National Biodiversity Institute, SAMBI, and obviously Cartosa, um, who you all know. So thanks to those partners. And then other stakeholders, just so that you are aware, they're quite targeted and quite specific. We've got the South African Environmental Observation Network, which is part of the global network, um, who both provide data and use data. We've got our provincial authorities. There are two provinces in South Africa that are important in, in our regard. One is Limpopo and the other is Mpumalanga. And we've got the authorities related to that. We've got um, NGOs, a particularly interesting one to mention that we work with quite a lot is the Center for Environmental Rights. It's a, an organization made up of environmental lawyers who try and help um, advocate and litigate in cases of environmental non-compliance. And again, if they don't have biodiversity data and they can't track trends, um, it's anecdotal if they're starting to make claims around loss of biodiversity. So they're very interested in, in what we're doing. And then a number of universities, which I won't detail anymore. Okay. Um, just in terms of our data collection system, you know, you can see our three main um, big basins or catchments on the, in the South African portion. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to go through the details here, except to say that the way that we go about collecting and collating data is what starts our what we're calling our social process, which aims to institutionalize the use of IFBIS and inwards. So we don't just ask people for data and, and then go and clean and collect it, but actually it's sitting with people using that opportunity to go through with them uh, what their needs are and then designing the, and Hugo will talk us through, designing um, the, the, uh, the kind of technical components according to what it is they need but then explaining to them what IFBIS is and explaining how it can be used in management and governance. And they then feed back to us about why things would or wouldn't work. You know, there's no point in designing a Rolls Royce if they can only drive a Beetle. So I think that process has been um, a really important one, particularly with Kruger, the Kruger National Park, and with um, the CMA. Remember, I said we've got the Incomati CMA, which managers down here. Um, and really listening to what they can use. And because they've had a number of systems designed for them that they essentially can't use because they either don't have the capacity or they don't have the, the technical um, infrastructure available, or <coughs> there's huge <laughs> payments associated with these decision support systems. So you'll see, I think Hugo will emphasized together with Tim this open source and and that really has made a huge difference in deploying technologies that they can use. Um, just a slide here about governance. Um, 
So we're all in the, in the business of designing tools. But I really want to emphasize that the tools are only as good as the governance system that you're in. And what you've got somebody, and the, the, our approach to, to governance is that it's what's called systemic social learning governance or adaptive governance. It's saying the windows of uncertainty are becoming much wider, particularly with climate change and uh, conflict around water use and the political economy of water and so on and so forth. And so what we've got here is a yachts woman. She's charting a course towards something, a common vision that the, all the, the people involved in the, in the sailing are doing. But she's responding constantly to feedback from the system. And often we don't know what these, these drivers and feedbacks look like. That's what makes these systems complex and uncertain. And river basins are complex and uncertain systems. And so when Hugo and I work with governance, we're trying to help people to, to develop their adaptive capacity. So we're trying to not be kind of all didactic about how we do it, but we say we're going to help you develop an adaptive response. Okay, so you're responding to feedback from the system. Mistakes that are made are seen as opportunities for learning, not as mistakes. And on a yearly or biannual basis, you'll, you'll revise your strategic plan because of this uncertainty. And it's not seen as a negative, but rather as it is the way the system is. It's complex and uncertain. Um, and so I think just when Hugo starts talking about inwards, um, bearing in mind that we've designed it to try and help managers cope with uncertainty and not be frightened by, but, but by recognizing and saying the world's uncertain and we need to manage within that context and learn. Okay, so I think really just emphasizing that. In a nutshell, in a more kind of, I suppose, more process-based way, uh, we've been identifying stakeholders, establishing relationships and formalizing data sharing agreements with them, collating and cleaning fish and invertebrate data, transforming that data, ensuring correct recognition, and then starting the process of training or, or rather it's sort of capacity development. And you can see some of the, the key stakeholders in the room. Um, at one of the workshops that we were able to have face-to-face, -face, you know, during kind of one of the less severe lockdowns of COVID, that has been a constraint. Um, collating and transforming data. I think most of you have been through this. It's been trying to find stuff in PhD or theses. It's been data that's held in papers. It's been Excel data sheets. We've even, <laughs> Hugo and I worked in the past with data collected in Word or handwritten data from some of our members. So, and then the, you know, the SAS system. Um, and all of that is, takes quite a long process of cleaning and, and, and collating that data. So we've been through that. Uh, very kindly, and thanks to FRC, we've got the IFAS template, and, and that is then input into that. Um, I won't go through too much of that. If anybody's interested, the template has um, quite a lot of data in it. There's some of the headings there, if it's of any interest. Um, and then we, we, we've also spent a lot of time having to clean data by going through this, what we call GIS filtration. A lot of the observations, and I'm sure many of you have had this, are not on the river. In fact, they end up in the middle of a house or something, <laughs> particularly in the way data were collected in the past. So we've created a buffer around each river order, <clears throat> varying between three and a thousand meters. And that helps us to identify and filter out these outliers. And then we go through a process of, of checking it. Um, so that, for example, is data that um, lies very far away from rivers, you know, so then we have to go in and, and look at why that's, we don't want to throw the data away. So, you know, it's almost on an individual case by case basis, trying to make sense of the data and creating a new layer out of that. So here's a, a more zoomed in um, impression around here. So, you know, you'll get data on a river, but then you'll also get data lying, lying in the uplands. So, you know, it's making decisions around what we do with that, with the data. Get there. We've also been going through a species check. We've got a master's list, and you'll find species that shouldn't occur in the area. We know they, they don't occur there, and then it's questioning why that's happening. Um, 
we've got very large data sets. I think Hugo will talk about that. We've had to go in and check for potential duplicates, of which we've had quite a lot. And just checking anything off the correct wing that we missed. And then we upload, upload all of that to Esprit. What we found, uh, you don't need to worry about the details of this, but finally, <laughs> We've got um, a fixed species for all, for all three of the water management areas, and we're able to now look at native species, indigenous species, introduced species, um, endemic species, and so on and so forth. Great sounds of that. We've been able to um, look at the status of fish species. Really important for us and for this water use licensing process is this critically endangered, we see that in red, and then there are threatened species. And together they make up close to 10% of what we're looking at. Um, we've also obviously been able to now break down the records by, by family. So this is all new. This was um, just simply not available before. Um, oh, I'll, I'll go through these. So you can see we've got a, a number of endemic species, again, really important to the decision making process. Um, <laughs> We, you know, we were saying one of the drivers of change are these introduced, um, you know, non-indigenous species. You can see how widespread they are throughout the basin. And then the, the endangered, critically endangered species, all important for decision making and previously unavailable data. Okay, so that was um, just kind of an overview there, Helen. Um, I think now if we can take a quick break and just see if there are any comments, questions um, before we go on and look at the details of, of both the IFBIS and INWIS. 